welcome. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us for our uh, spring 2022 BDK Yokijaki Fujitani Interfaith Program. Do you know why? Exploring rituals and sacred spaces. My name is Sister Malia, Dr. Wong, and I'm happy to um, host you today. So we have three wonderful guests to introduce to you today. They will be leading us on a virtual mini open house as we explore how certain symbols and practices support their faiths. A little bit about our sponsor. The Bukyo Dendo Kyokai Yoshiaki Fujitani Interfaith Program at Shamanad University of Honolulu has for its mission, the bringing together of the Buddhist community with other religious communities in Hawaii to promote interfaith dialogue and to provide opportunities for understanding and action for peace and justice in our community. So now I would like to turn it over to our moderator, but a little bit about her first. Miss Emma Sherrill is a communications marketing major at Chaminade University with a minor in psychology. Emma will be graduating next week from Chaminade University and she will be the moderator of this program. So I'd now like to turn it over to Emma. So Emma. Thank you, Sister Malia. Once again, my name is Emma Sherrell and I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. Um, today during this meeting, we ask that you keep your audio muted during the program. And then towards the end, we will be taking questions from the audience. Uh, from during the um, meeting itself, you feel free, sorry, excuse me, feel free to submit your questions through the chat feature. Um, let us begin with Anella Meiji. She's a biology major and will be graduating in 2023. Thank you, Emma. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to be opening with a recording of an oli, or in Hawaiian, that's a chant. It's called Eho Mai, and I invite you all to join along if you'd like. Eho Mai, Kaiki Mai, Una Mai, Una Mia, Una, Una Mili. Eu mei, eu mei, eu mei, eu mei, kai ke mei, una mei, una mea, una no eu, una mele, eu mei, eu mei, eu mei, eu mei, kai ke mei, Una me, una me, una no e, una me le, yo me, yo me, yo me. Thank you, Anella. Our first presenter today will be Father Paul, and he will be introduced by Isti Karupa, who is also a biology major and will be also graduating next week. The Father Paul Isaac has been in the Coptic Orthodox Church since he was born. He and his wife Marina are originally from Southern California, and they moved here to Oahu in 2020. Father Paul earned his Bachelor's of Science in Psychology from Heitzer College in Claremont, California. He earned his Master's in School of Psychology from California Baptist University and another Master's in Theological Studies from St. Athanasius and St. Sarah Coptic Orthodox Theological School in Southern California. In his free time, Father Paul likes to walk, read, play ping pong and basketball and spend time with his friends and family. Today, he'll be speaking about symbols and practices in his faith tradition. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I express my gratitude to sister uh, for asking me to, to come here. And I thank all of you for sharing your time and joining this event. I would like to start by welcoming you all to the church. And I will share my screen and I will give you a quick tour before I focus on the one to three symbols and rituals that I will share. 
So here we have our church. And I will go to the door so you can see the door. So here is the door that we all enter through. And it is um, tradition that once we enter, that we do the sign of the cross. And we say, we worship you, O Christ, with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, for you have come and saved us. So we see right from the start, once we enter the church doors, we say a prayer, and that helps us to focus on prayer and the reason why we're in church and to get ready for the service. Our Coptic church here is very special because of the icons. So right away, your eyes will be fixated on these icons and the beautiful colors. And I will go through them quickly. Here on the back wall, let me zoom in. Here on the back wall, we have three stories in this icon. And when we refer to icons, we refer to the iconographer. In this case, it was one who's very talented. And we say that she writes the icon because the icon tells us a story. And in this icon, on the back wall of the church, we see three stories. We see in the very back, the three pyramids of Egypt. We see here Moses as a young baby. We see to the left here, St. Mary and Joseph with a young Christ. And that is their entry into Egypt. And then we see here on the bottom right, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, and the split of the Red Sea. So there we see three stories that were written in this icon. And then if we go to the right, here we see in the Gospel of Luke, it's mentioned that Christ healed a woman who had, who couldn't stand straight. So she had a problem with her back. And we read in Luke that he tells us that Christ touched her back and she was immediately healed. And this was done on the Sabbath. So the iconographer here, she depicts the story very well, and she shows just some of the facial features of the people who were telling Christ it's the Sabbath. How could you perform a miracle? We are supposed to rest. And then if we keep going, the transfiguration of Christ on the left and the theophany of Christ, the baptism. And I'll show you another picture later when we get to it about the three uh, symbols or rituals you'll see that we have a baptismal font right under the theophany. Here on this side, we have the birth of Christ on the left, and then the three magi and St. Mary. And then we have Christ's entry into the temple and St. Simon. And of course, as you can see, the colors are very vibrant, and it's very comforting to the heart to see these images. Then here, towards the left of the sanctuary of the altar, we have three icons. On the left, we have St. Mark, who the church is named after because St. Mark is the founder of Christianity in Egypt. So usually in any uh, state or region, the first church will be named after St. Mark or St. Mary, but it's usually St. Mark. And then in the middle, we have Archangel Gabriel, announcing to St. Mary the birth of Christ. And then to the right, we have St. Mary and the child Jesus. Here in the middle, I will zoom out. This is our sanctuary, our altar. And tradition tells us, just like when Moses was in the bush, Christ told Moses, take off your sandals because where you stand is holy. So here, any time we enter the altar, we take off our shoes, or if we're going to the Eucharist, we also take off our shoes. Some churches in other states, especially in Egypt, they actually take off their shoes outside. So once they enter the church, their shoes are off. So it goes to show you that we keep these traditions. 
And inside the sanctuary, inside the altar, you will see Christ on the throne and the 24 presbyters who are offering incense and praising God. And then on top here, we have Christ when he gave his disciples his body and blood. And then towards the right here, I'll zoom in. We have Christ, the Pantocrator. And we have in the middle the Theophany again. And then we have a saint who's very famous in Egypt. His name is Saint Mina, the Wonder Worker. And we call him the Wonder Worker because he has performed many, many miracles to the people who, who pray and who ask for his prayers for them to Christ. And then we have podiums that we read um, St. Paul's epistles from, the Catholic letters, a psalm and gospel, and a life of a saint, usually every service. Then, just to conclude the quick church tour, on this side of the wall, we have on the left, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended um, upon the, the disciples and the Marys. And then we have, after the resurrection, when Christ ascended up into heaven. We have there. And then we have the suffering or the passions of Christ on this middle wall in our church. On the left, we have uh, the crucifixion of Christ and St. Mary and St. John. And then we have Christ who's carrying the cross, St. Simon the Cyrene, and then St. Longinos, who is the one who pierced Christ. And then we have Christ praying in the garden and the disciples were sleeping. And we remember that this is a, rem a reminder to us to always pray if we ever feel lazy or tired or have an excuse. We remember here Christ telling his disciples, you couldn't stay up with me for an hour and pray. And then to finish off here, we have Christ's entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday. And we actually keep this tradition um, Palm Sunday here in the churches, we actually get palms and we decorate the churches, uh, we de decorate the pews. So we would have here in the middle, we would have arches that would go up. We had four arches this year. Um, and then we decorate the church with palms. So it's a very festive, very festive time. So that was just a quick uh, tour of the church. And then now I want to just touch on the three symbols or rituals. And when we come in to pray, I mentioned we say that quick prayer when we walk in and then this place is holy, the church is holy. So we take off our shoes for when it's the time of the Eucharist or we ascend into the sanctuary. And I also want to note that when we come and pray, we pray with full participation of our body. So you might ask, what does that mean? And that means that we worship with all our senses. We worship with our eyes because we're looking towards the sanctuary and we're looking at these beautiful icons and the sense of smell because we have here, let me show you. I will share another portion of my screen. We have a sensor. We have a sensor here, and this is our sense of smell. So we put a coal inside the sensor, and we use this very often in, in all of our services. We put a coal inside the sensor. We put incense because we know that incense are the prayers of the saints and our prayers as well. So the sense of smell, our ears, because we listen to the hymns that are chanted. And then when we touch, when we touch, we take the blessings of an icon or blessings of the bread from the priest. And then, of course, taste when we partake of the Eucharist, the body and the blood. And we know that it's bread and wine and they are transformed through the mystery of the Eucharist into Christ's body and blood. So that's just an introduction to our prayer and the full participation of prayer. And the three services that I just want to speak about today are baptism is number one, 
the divine liturgy and will focus just on the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ. And then another joyful event of weddings in the Coptic Orthodox tradition and the church. So first the baptism, I will show you here. If you remember from the quick tour that I just gave, we had this uh, icon of theophany and we have a very small baptismal font. Uh, this is for little, little children um, or young uh, babies. And we also have a larger one that we use as well if the person is older. And here, baptism, we know um, that St. John had a baptism of repentance, and then Christ came with the baptism um, of the Holy Spirit. And here, the, the church teaches us that once we are immersed in the water, we are immersed three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that when we are immersed, we die with Christ. And once we rise from the water, we are risen with Christ. And there is a very beautiful hymn that we chant in our midnight praise. And it says, take off the old man and put on the new and superior one. And that is exactly what we believe happens here. And the Holy Spirit is upon this water. And this water symbolizes the Jordan River where Christ himself was baptized. So we learn from Christ the perfect and true example for us. And after we come out of the water, the priest will anoint us with the Maroon oil, and that is the seal of the Holy Spirit. And then this is done before the divine liturgy, and then we continue the divine liturgy, and we partake of the Eucharist for the first time. So we're baptized, and then we partake of the, the Eucharist. So that uh, is a summary of the baptism. So we see a new life, we see death, and we see the resurrection. And this is due to the ancestral sin of Adam in the very beginning. So there was that separation that all humans are born with because of their disobedience of Adam and Eve. And then we become baptized, and then we take we partake of the divine Eucharist. Next, the divine liturgy. The divine liturgy, and of course, at the end, we partake of the Eucharist. And here, the divine liturgy is broken into parts. So the first part is the offertory, where the bread is baked, and it's offered, and the priest will pick the best one. So there's usually at least three, that's the minimum, and it can go up to as many as 15, but of course the plate is not that large, but it's always an odd number. And the offertory in the, the ancient days is people used to come and they used to bring what the church needed in order for the offertory. So for example, the church would need wine, they would need a uh, flower for the making of the, the holy bread. They would need coal, they would need incense, they would need things for the altar, they would need books, so many things. So this is why it's called the offertory because people would come, they would offer their things. In addition to, they would offer their prayers. So at this time, everyone is lifting their prayers while the priest or the clergy member is picking the most perfect loaf of bread that will become the body of Christ. That's the offertory. Then we have the liturgy of the word. And I showed you the podium during, during the, the tour. And I'll just share the church again. And the liturgy of the word, we read from the podium, from this podium on the right. And we read one of uh, Pauline, uh, St. Paul's epistles. We read uh, a Catholic epistle, and then we read from the Acts of the Apostles, those three from the New Testament. And then we usually read a life of a saint. So we, we learn from that saint. And then we read a psalm and a gospel. And usually all of the readings for the divine liturgy and the liturgy of the word 
are connected. All of them are connected. And you see a theme throughout all of the readings. After the liturgy of the word, we have the liturgy of the believers. And in the old tradition, the catechumens, they would attend the liturgy of the word to learn. And there, there would usually be a homily given by the priest. But after this, once it's time for the liturgy of the believers, the catechumens would leave in the old days because they were not baptized yet. But now they're allowed to stay, they're allowed to see and watch and pray and, of course, ask questions because we are welcoming to everyone. And the liturgy of the believers, it ends with the celebration of the Eucharist. And with the celebration of the Eucharist, that is when everyone partakes of the body and the blood of Christ. And here at the church at St. Mark's, um, sister was actually able to attend and it made us and the whole community very happy. We had an open house and we shared um, everything about the church. We opened the curtain, how it's looking right now. And we went into depth about the Eucharist and how our church services are. And we said that the celebration of the Eucharist is what everyone is waiting for. This is how we have union with Christ to partake of him. And this is how we stay close with him. And the last ritual that I want to go over is the wedding. And of course, all three events, baptism, divine liturgy, and wedding are all very joyous occasions and they're all done in the church. And here, we again, we have the Pauline Epistle and we have a psalm and gospel. And the very end of the gospel for the wedding, it says, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And again, this shows the importance of having the wedding ceremony done in the church with the prayers that we have in the Coptic Orthodox tradition. And it begins, the wedding, it begins with a Thanksgiving prayer. And like I mentioned, there's a psalm, gospel, and a letter from St. Paul. And we don't necessarily have vows, like some people are used to, but we have a wedding commandment that is read by a clergy member to the bride and the groom. We say, my beloved son, so-and-so, and we read them a commandment my beloved daughter, so-and-so, and we read the commandment. It's very, very powerful. And there's also a commandment for the baptism as well. And it states what you need to do as a faithful Christian because the catechism and the baptism is just the first part. It's the first step into the church, very important step in the church. And you only grow from there. And that's why... If you remember, it starts with the catechism and the baptism. And then right after is the divine liturgy and the, the first communion for the person who was baptized. And then later on is, is the wedding if they, if they choose to get married later on. And everything is done in the church. That's why, if we remember in the Acts of the Apostles, they would meet every Sunday and they would break bread and they would assemble together and pray and sing hymns. So again, we see the importance of the church. And thank God the Coptic Church does a wonderful job of keeping its traditions, keeping its rights, and also the church fathers. Because in everything we do, we have scripture. We have the scripture, the Holy Scripture. We have the tradition, whether it's oral tradition or written tradition. And then we have the church fathers. So in everything that the Coptic church does, we include those three and it's wholesome. And like I mentioned before, and just to conclude, when we come to the church, we worship with our whole being. We worship and full participation, and we're attentive. And as you saw, we have screens, and we have books, as you can see in the pews. 
And just to close, I, I invite all of you to come to the church because I personally don't think that this uh, virtual tour does the iconography justice and we can sit and I know there will be time at the end of this for questions. So I'm very excited to hear about the two other presentations that are up next. And again, I thank you for allowing me to show you our beloved church here in Honolulu, St. Mark's. Thank you. Thank you, Father Paul, for your tour of the beautiful church and sharing your insight um, of, the of the church's few rituals. Our next presenter is Imam Matula Joya, and he will be present. He will be introduced by Kathleen Joyce, who is also a biology major and graduating in 2022. Thank you, Emma. So now I would like to share a little presentation on Imam Matula Joya. So Imam Matilio Joya was originally from Pakistan. He migrated to Canada with his family at age 11. He lived in Pakistan for 11 years, Canada for 16 years, Liberia for six months, the Marshall Islands for five years and the United States for five years. He is a devotee missionary for the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. After high school, he did a seven year degree in theology from the Ahmadiyya Institute of Islamic Studies in Canada and graduated in 2010. The program he studied focused on comprehensive subjects like the Quran, Hadith, Islamic jurisprudence, comparative religions, and learning Arabic and Urdu languages. He became a full-time missionary or imam for the community after graduation and has served proudly since 2010. What motivated him in this field was that his entire life since childhood, he was devoted to the service of Islam Ahmadiyya and was inspired by a quote from the Holy Quran, which is shown in the slideshow. Some of his hobbies or interests are spending time with his family and friends, traveling the world and seeing his beauty. He also has a passion for teaching others. And the message he wants the audience to take from his presentation is that Islam is a religion of peace, love and harmony. Mahalo nui loa. Aloha everyone. First of all, uh, just a sound check. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Thumbs up. All right. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with um, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, the gracious, the merciful. First of all, um, my gratitude from bottom of my heart to Sister Malia, uh, Department of uh, Religious uh, Studies of uh, Sheminar University, um, Clyde, Kathleen, Emma, and especially all the audience. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Father Paul, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation and also um, Reverend um, Takahashi, I look forward to your presentation as well, sir. For um, today's presentation, I have uh, prepared some slides, uh, which I'd like to share with you. So the first one is uh, about just basics of a religion of Islam, mostly because many of you may be new to the faith and um, therefore may not have that much um, knowledge of the faith. So I'll be just sharing this. Just bear with me, please. Okay, here we go. There it is. So as a religion of Islam, it is based on um, certain, a set of beliefs and then a set of um, acts that we do. Uh, the set of beliefs are called Articles of Islam. They are six in, in number. And then there are pillars of Islam, which are some acts of worship that Muslims do around the world. And they are five in number. So first of all, just basic information. Currently, Muslim population around the globe is about 1.9 billion. It's the second re uh, religion in the world. The main population is uh, found, as you can see, Majority of it is found in, um, you know, in uh, Indian subcontinent. That's where I'm from as well. And then the Arab Middle East, and then of course the uh, Indonesia. 
that's where the majority of the population is. This is just briefly before I get into obviously the main subject of our presentation is uh, religious symbols, the mosque, and, and some information about that, which I have gathered uh, to share with you this evening or this afternoon. Uh, but this is just quickly to go through. These are the six articles of faith any Muslim in the world would uh, believe in. So this is um, unanimously agreed upon uh, with all Muslims around the globe. First one is to believe in Allah. Allah is just an Arabic word for God. Um, Christians in the Middle East, they refer to God with Allah. So it's just, uh, it should not be confused with any other, um, uh, you know, God uh, or anything like that. It's the same God that, uh, you know, it is referred to in English as well. Believe in angels is the second one, which Muslims believe in, that they are spiritual beings that are there for um, doing the uh, tasks of God and they are obedient to God. Third is they believe in revelations or the books of God. Namely, there are four mentioned in the Holy Quran that Muslims are supposed to believe in um, religiously. Um, the first is a Zabur. These are the Psalms of David to Prophet David, peace be upon him. Torah is, uh, uh, to you know, Torah, we call it in Arabic, but Torah, Injil is the Gospels of Prophet Jesus and the Holy Quran to Prophet Muhammad. So as Muslims, we're supposed to believe in all of these uh, revelations. Then is uh, uh, believe in the prophets. So there are more about 25 prophets, namely mentioned. Most of them are biblical prophets. So as Muslims, we are supposed to believe in all of these prophets that are uh, either mentioned or not mentioned in the Quran. And uh, fundamentally, as Muslims, we believe that all religions that exist in the world are true religion they are sent by the same god as if they are branches of the same tree a day of judgment is also a concept which is found in islam similar to judaism and christianity that um, after our demise we would be uh, answerable for our actions in the world in our this life and uh, that is uh, also we do not believe that muslims have monopoly over paradise or heaven or hell this is a metaphorical uh, third dimension which we may not describe it but metaphorically we are told that uh, it's it's a place where we would have more exposure or a closeness to god the almighty which in reality is is paradise so and then we talk about and the last one is a, a believe in predestination meaning believing believing on the fact that certain things are um, are uh, you know predestined for us and we should accept them as they are decree of God. Uh, now the five pillars of Islam again I'm just trying to go uh, quickly for you to have an overview of the faith before you see the, uh, the mosque and some of the fun pictures uh, that I have in the other slide. Um, five things again first one is uh, shahada or public uh, witnessing or declaration of faith uh, that and this is the wording of the shahada anyone who becomes it's equivalent to baptism in christianity where anyone who uh, decides to uh, convert to islam he would read these phrases first in arabic and english or in their native language uh, to be considered or called as muslims and this is enough for anyone to join the faith second pillar of islam is salah salat is a prescribed prayer which is offered five times a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So there is no, uh, there is no um, uh, holiday in the prayer. So it's just about five to seven minutes of prayer service. It's done individually or ideally it's in the mosque, especially in the Muslim communities, five times a day, uh, you know, the, the congregational prayer is offered. These are approximate timings for each of, each of the prayers. Then charity is also... Um, uh, another pillar of Islam, which is giving um, to the needy, to the poor, to the deserving 2.5% of our, our annual savings after our expenses and taxes. Uh, Psalm, this is in the um, uh, very important aspect of Islamic faith is as well. This is celebrated or uh, per, uh, observed in the month of Ramadan, which is the ninth Muslim calendar. In fact, this month that we are right now in uh, it's the month of ramadan so in right now i am fasting as well and uh, we would be breaking the fast uh, on um, 
tomorrow night and then from Monday, that's where our Eats festival is, which I will also share with you. So fasting basically is abstaining from uh, eating or drinking, smoking or any intimate relationship uh, during the uh, daylight hours from the dawn until the sunset. Then the pilgrimage is the last one. This is, um, you know, once in a lifetime, if a person is healthy, financially fit, and if the path to Mecca is clear, then it is obligatory on every Muslim to perform it once in their lifetime. This is where uh, Hajj is celebrated. The square shaped building is believed to be uh, res built and constructed by Prophet Abraham, father of all three major world religions, and his son Ishmael. Uh, about 4,000 years ago. So that's what the Muslims... So this was, um, in a nutshell, about our, um, you know, the some of the basic overview of... Uh, and now I'd like to share with you some of the rituals and uh, basically the fun part. Hopefully this will keep you more engaged and uh, more, uh, you know, att your attention will be more... Uh, focused, I think. Mosques in general, uh, this is the main religious uh, symbol, or you can say uh, sacred, most sacred place. Mosques in the Holy Quran, God the Almighty states that mosques are houses of God, they're built for God. So they are places of worship, not only for Muslims as a believer, I believe it's a house of worship and anybody who uh, wishes to worship in uh, the house of God is welcome. They don't have to be a Muslim. Um, so Prophet Muhammad himself, for example, um, offered his own mosque in Medina, you know, to the Christian delegation that came from Najran, a southern part, a southern town uh, of Medina. So this is, uh, and then also mosques, uh, let's, uh, maybe we can talk about the reason why mosques come into picture is because, you know, obviously, as I mentioned, five times a day, every Muslim is expected to go to the mosque to offer their uh, worship, their prayers. And that's the ideal, because prayer in congregation has more reward um, than offering it at home. There are mandatory and optional prayers. Mandatory prayers are the fun five that I mentioned, which is offered in the morning before sunrise, early afternoon, late afternoon, evening, and then at night. Um, for each prayer at every mosque that exists in the world, and there are hundreds and thousands, perhaps millions of them, you will see uh, these elements. You'll see an azan being called. An azan is called to the prayer. So this is, uh, we do not have bells or, um, or uh, any other instrument that you use to call people. And traditionally, obviously, now everybody has watches, but before, uh, if uh, congregation slot was to happen or prayer was to happen, it would be called by uh, someone who was called Muazzin, who would uh, stand on an elevated place. And from there, he would say certain words, uh, which would be calling them to the prayer, and informing the public that it was time for the prayer. That explains why you uh, see minarets associated with the mosque. So you may see minarets in every mosque and that is traditionally started off because on top of the minaret the caller to the prayer would uh, go up and call the people to prayer five times a day every single day and then um, ablution is another important part of the prayer so uh, before we uh, even begin our prayer we have to do a ritual of washing our hands our face uh, wiping off our head and also washing our feet so this is mentally we're preparing ourselves for the prayer. Then before you enter a mosque, you would see a shoe rack where uh, people leave on of their shoes and then they would go into the carpeted area where um, the prayer is actually offered. And they stand in rows and then also they follow the imam. So they stand in rows in the front is the imam who leads the prayer service in congregation. These are some of the pictures that would help you uh, understand just how mosque looks like and at the end I uh, would certainly share uh, you know our mosque here as well how it looks like it's not as big as it's showing the pictures but you know hopefully it'll give you a glimpse of how it actually looks like here in Honolulu um, so these are these are this is, these are some of the pictures not from our mosque but from other mosques that uh, in the in the mainland 
uh, where uh, uh, the congregant would first come. First thing is that they would uh, perform ablution and they would sit on this stool uh, like, um, you know, bench and then they would wash their um, hands and, the, you know, up to elbows. They're supposed to wash their arms and the whole ritual part, they, they, they do that before entering. And then they'll take off their shoes. As you can see in the shoe racks are here. This is before every mosque, you will see these two things um, as is. This is a mosque from our uh, community, Ahmadiyya Muslim community, which is in England. It's the biggest mosque in Europe, um, London. And um, these inscriptions you can see in Arabic um, in the, around the dome, it says, Allah basically, Allah is al kulub, which means certainly hearts can find contentment with the remembrance of God. So these are the calligraphic ways. Uh, this is a verse from the Holy Quran, uh, which is uh, posted here. And it is a tradition you'll see in mosques. Uh, people have inscriptions of, uh, you know, different verses of the Quran or words um, in Arabic language. So this is, for example, uh, the Kaaba. This is in Mecca, where the pilgrimage is offered. And uh, uh, you can see all the Muslims have to face towards this square shaped building. So that's another thing which is important for you to know that every Muslim uh, faces towards this square shaped building uh, when he prays. Now, this is just a picture just to give you a glimpse of how it looks like in the Muslim world. Um, so this is a, a mosque in New Delhi. It's called the Shahi Mosque. It was built by one of the um, emperors. And uh, you can see how um, people are praying in rows with their heads covered. So head covering is a symbol of respect, showing respect. Um, to um, another being or individual in the society. So that's why uh, heads are covered. You may also see that uh, in Muslim, we uh, do have a separate place for women to offer their prayers and for men to offer their prayer. This is another uh, way of uh, another element where they prostrate. We you know, bow uh, and put our forehead and nose on the floor as a symbol of utmost humility as it is also discussed and mentioned in the Holy Bible about um, how Prophet uh, Moses and other prophets used to pray. Hmm. I just want to follow up on time. So I think I have a few more minutes remaining. So this is another picture that you can see, a uh, typical mosque where, um, you know, how people are praying in rows. This is another mosque, how you can see an uh, imam is standing in, in front, and then it is followed by the congregants at the back in standing in rows. Uh, now, fasting, I've already shared with you some of the other things. Uh, it's a pre-dawn meal is offered, like in the beginning, we have breakfast, then we have after sunset, we break our fast, have dinner, and culturally, in the Muslim world, they have uh, lectures on the Quran. It is much uh, uh, recited by everyone. And then also a special prayer is Taravi, which is called. This is Eid al-Fitr, which is a celebration. So uh, these two Eids are, um, you know, celebrated in the Muslim world. Equivalent to, you can say, Christmas, one of the biggest days. So Eid al-Fitr means the Eid of, or the celebration of, or the feast of, breaking of the fasting month or the fasts so it uh, you know it starts with offering some charity uh it's uh, you know we're expected to shower get ready wear new clothes offer our eid prayer in the mosque and after that family food and fun kids get some uh some you know some money to buy candies and stuff and then also uh henna or mehndi we call it is also applied by the girls and ladies. This is uh, another part of uh, important, as I was mentioning, the Hajj. And uh, it's performed once in a year. And you can see here, these are all people all around. Um, as far as you can see in 2018, for example, according to Wikipedia, there were 7.9 Muslims uh, at one occasion in one place, so the largest gathering in the world. And um, these, these are some of the rituals of, of the Hajj, the pilgrimage, different destinations. They are miles apart. Eid al-Adha is uh, another festival which is uh, in commemoration of the sacrifice of Prophet Abraham, uh, willing to sacrifice his own son for the sake of God. 
and uh, just commemorate that event, Muslim slaughter uh, a sheep or a goat or an animal as a sacrifice, um, commemorating that sacrifice. This happens about two months and 10 days after the first Eid. Friday prayer is also uh, considered to be um, you know, uh, assembly day of the week. So every week on Friday is our, you can call a Sabbath day for, uh, for Muslims. That's when they are told to go and offer congregation prayer in the main um, mosque. So this is, uh, but it's a little bit different where we are allowed to work um, on that day as well, unlike the others. Newborn, uh, you know, when a newborn is, uh, is born, there is a, a ritual of calling azan or call to the prayer, prayer uh, which is, you know, saying of uh, some Arabic phrases uh, signifying greatness of God and spirituality. These are offered in, in, in both of his ears, obviously in a very low tone. And uh, shaving of the hair after the seventh day is also a ritual. Uh, male circumcision uh, is done as well. And then a kika uh, feast is provided by the parents to the family and friends. Marriage is the same thing. So once again, let me just check the time. Um, okay, so I have about 30 minutes left. Mm -hmm. So marriage is, uh, is uh, another thing. There are three uh, parts to the marriage. There are three ceremonies. It's uh, nikah, which is announcement of the, mar uh, of the marriage. Then is the actual wedding when the bride goes to the, um, to the bridegroom and the reception is a meal or feast given by the bridegroom. These are three occasions. And uh, there is a dowry also set uh, by which it has to be paid by the bridegroom to the bride at, at any uh, fixed uh, time and date. Funeral prayers as well is something, uh, you know, the recitation of the verses of the Quran are generally uh, done when a person dies uh, as his soul is transferring to the next life. Uh, we say, inna lillahi wa inna rajun. This is a phrase which means to God we all belong and to him shall we all return. And uh, washing of the body after that, the body is dressed in three clothes, uh, three pieces of clothes in white, plain clothes. And this is just an indication that we, the person is returning back as he arrives so when a person arrives obviously he's you know welcomed or taken in a, in a towel or a cloth and then he, he starts his life journey so this is the last part of his life is in a similar way burial um, is all, it should be buried as soon as possible and the grave should have some sort of casket or uh, a dome so that uh, the soil it, it does not uh, mutilate the body um, and then there are some other prayers as well now, at the end, if uh, you may allow me, I would like to share um, our mosque here that I'm sitting in. And uh, again, it's uh, all of you guys are welcome. Anytime it's in Kalihi, Sister Malia has the address. Um, so you are, you'll be welcome to, uh, you know, come here anytime you like. I'm going to show you guys just like that. Um, so this is a little bit of area where um, I was sitting right now. It's a library. Uh, conference table and then when they enter you can see these two um, you know the because we pray on the floor so uh, the prayer mats are there for the congregants we're a small community here but you know and then we can see over here is this is where the uh, imam stands and then the podium and then this this is the men area and this is the uh, uh, female area again this is something which is uh, part of the um, you know, our tradition, culture, uh, that we have um, two separate rooms for male and female. So with this, thank you very much once again, um, all of you for patiently listening. Hopefully uh, you were able to learn something. And then I would, I would really look forward to um, answering any of your questions that you may have. Thank you very much once again. Mahalo nui loa. Thank you, Imam uh, Matula, for giving us an introduction into your religion and then also talking about the rituals that you mentioned as the fun part. Um, I definitely found the different pillars very interesting. Um, our last presenter today was Reverend Kazunori. Um, he will be introduced by Brittany Bogle, a religious study major who will also be graduating in about a week. Hi, everybody.
everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Reverend Kaz Kazanori. Sorry, I'm having some screen share issues here. Give me just one moment. Reverend Kazanori was born in Yamaguchi, Japan, and his home temple was actually established 520 years ago. He is the 19th generation that was born there, and prior to becoming um, a Buddhist minister, he dreamed of being a school teacher. He loves being a Buddhist minister because he enjoys sharing Buddhist teachings and also meeting new people, and he appreciates interfaith dialogue. He's participated in many different interfaith um, programs from Joint Memorial Services, Peace Day, and Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And then one of the things that I thought was fascinating, just the information that I got from him, is I asked him what advice does he have for people that are struggling in their faith or trying to find their faith. And he said, what religions are around you? And he was very passionate in saying that just talk to family, friends, teachers, really share kind of what you're going through, have that interfaith dialogue, read books and watch sermons. And one thing that I thought that he said was very beautiful is if you cannot find faith as a result of these efforts, you may suddenly encounter it later by chance, basically saying that the door just isn't closed permanently, that it can open later on in life and so that there's no reason to rush. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Brittany, for your kind of introductions and uh, Sister Maria and Clyde from BDK. Uh, thank you very much for organizing today's event. And uh, thank you everyone for attending at uh, this event. And thank you, uh, the Father Paul and Imam uh, Matilda uh, for your wonderful presentations today. You know, uh, I, learned, I have already learned many new things. So thank you very much. Today, I wanna do my presentation uh, showing the video and welcome all of you to uh, the temple of Honpa Honganji Hirobetsu. So now uh, I wanna uh, share the video. So one moment, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kazunori Takahashi. I'm the Buddhist minister of Honpa Honganji Mission of Hawaii and currently serving Honpa Honganji Hirobetsu located uh, in Hiro on the Big Island. Today, I want to show the temple to all of you. Uh, now I'm in the parking lot of Hiro Betsui. And uh, can you see uh, the building? That's the main temple of Honpa Hongan Hiro Betsui. Now I will take you to the temple. Now I am going up the stairs to the main temple entrance. The right side, you know, you can see the temple office. So let's go to the temple. This temple building was built in 1926 and the foundation was made in 1925. And uh, from here, you know, we can see you know, Hiro Bay. And the opposite side is the temple entrance. So this is the entrance of main temple, Honba Honganji Hiro Betsuin. So this is the entrance. And today, I want to introduce not only the temple, but also a bit of etiquette of our denomination. There are many different Buddhist denominations with different teachings and rituals. Then I will talk about it based on our tradition. So I hope you will keep that in mind uh, during my uh, presentation. So now let's enter the temple. When entering the temple, uh, we always bow slightly to show our respect. So this is how we enter the main temple.
So now let's go to the front of the altar. You can see many pews here, and those who attend religious services always sit here. Currently, for safety reasons, the seats are still arranged to ensure the physical distances. So now you can see the altar or the inner sanctuary area. I will talk about this place later. Once again, welcome to Honpa Honganji Hirobetsu Inn. I am glad you are here today, although it is via Zoom. And I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the BDK Yoshiaki Fujitani Interfaith Program at Shaminat University of Honolulu for inviting me as one of the guest speakers today. First, I would like to introduce this temple. The official name of the temple is Honpa Honganji Hirobetsu In. The Honpa Honganji is a shortened name of our denomination. Jodo Shinshu Honganji Ha and the Betsuin means the branch temple in Japanese and our mother temple is Honganji in Kyoto, Japan and so this temple is considered a branch temple so the name is Hiro Betsuin. The temple belongs to the Jodo Shin Buddhism, one of the pure land shrine of Mahayana Buddhism. It is one of 32 temples affiliated with the Honpa Honganji Mishoba Hawaii. Our headquarters is located on the Pali Highway in Honolulu. So if you live in Honolulu, you have probably seen this temple. Hirobetsuin was founded in 1889. The first Japanese arrived in Hawaii in 1868 and those people were called Gannen Mono, which means the people of the founding year of Japan's Meiji era. Then later, official immigration from Japan began in 1885. Then in 1889, Reverend Soryu Kagahi, a minister of our denomination, came to Hawaii from Japan and established temples in Honolulu and Hilo. This is the origin uh, of uh, this temple, Honpa Honganji Hilo Betsuin, as well as our denomination in Hawaii, Honpa Honganji Mission of Hawaii. And since then, the ministers, a tremendous number of members and friends, have sustained the temple and transmitted the teaching until today. As I mentioned earlier, the present Hirobetsin's main temple was built in 1926. As you may have noticed, this was not built in the Japanese style, but has a slightly Indian appearance. Eight years before the completion of this temple, the Honpa Honganji Hawaii Betsin in Honolulu eh, was completed. Then this building was not a Japanese style temple, but rather a Gandhara style and Byzantine style building. According to our history, this style was adopted as part of the globalization efforts of our propagation. In other words, the architecture was also globalized at that time. But therefore, the main temple of Hirobetsuin which was built around the same time is also in line with the trend of that time. The exterior of the temple is built in the Indian style, but as you can see, the main temple is in the American style and the inner sanctuary is in the Japanese style. The fusion of various cultures is one of the characteristics of this temple. I think people of various religions are attending this session today. 
そうです。Some of you may have never seen a Buddhist temple inside before, so I would like to tell you a little bit more about temples. Originally, a temple was defined as a place where Buddhist statues are enshrined and monks live to concentrate Buddhist practices. The origin of Buddhist temples dates back to the time of Shakamuni Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, who lived in India about 2,500 years ago. So according to the biography of the Buddha, King Bimbisara, who was a king of the Magadha Kingdom, became a devotee after listening to the Buddha's teachings and offered the bamboo grove as the first Buddhist monastery. Then, as Buddhism spread throughout the world, temples were built in many different places. The temple's structure also differs among the denominations and has various unique aspects. In the case of our denomination, as you can see, the temple is divided into an inner sanctuary and an outer sanctuary. The inner sanctuary or altar area, we enshrine the altar and ministers conduct Buddhist services. In the outer sanctuary, People gather to attend services and listen to the Buddhist teachings. Therefore, in our school, the temple is considered a place for listening to the teachings rather than a place for monks to practice. And this is because of our teachings. Then now I would like to focus on today's main topic, the meaning of altar ornaments. In our school, the inner sanctuary represents the Amida Buddha's pure land or the world of enlightenment. It is said that this is a visual and a three dimensional creation of the pure land. So, in the center of this area, so a statue of the Buddha called Amida Buddha is enshrined. So can you see? Amida Buddha, the statue is there. Amida Buddha is the Buddha of immeasurable light and life, and always working for us with his wisdom and compassion. The object of reverence differs depending on denominations too. Some other Buddhist schools enshrine other Buddhas, for example, the Shakamuni Buddha, or the Great Sun Buddha, or the Dainichi Yorai in Japanese, or Mandara, and so on. Perhaps some of you may be surprised to see such an altar with a statue enshrined and wonder if Buddhists worship idols. However, this is not for the purpose of worshipping the statue. If the statue itself has some power and is worshipped, it is idolatry, but Buddhist statues are considered as one way to lead people to have faith. It is said that the purpose of the statue is to receive the heart of Buddha through cherishing the statue enshrined in the altar. So on both sides of this main altar, there are two picture scrolls. On the right side, there is an image of Shinran Shoni, who is the founder of Shin Buddhism. And among the various teachings of Buddhism, he selected the Shin Buddhism, which means the true pure land Buddhism. Then on the left side, there is a picture scroll of Renyo Shoni, the eighth head minister of Honganji. And thanks to his efforts, the teaching spread throughout Japan, so we hang a picture scroll of him. The temple of other Buddhist sects may also display a picture of the founder of the sect or person who played an important role in the sect. So I would like to talk a little bit more about this altar area. The center of the altar area is the statue of the Buddha. Then we place flowers, incense, 
and candles in front of the statue and the picture scrolls. So do you sometimes send or give flowers to others? If a family member or friend is not well or has a sad event, you may send flowers as a gift and show sympathy. You may also send flowers for celebrations or special occasions, but thus flowers have the power to support us in both joy and sorrow. Then about incense, the fragrance is not visible, but its purity pervades the space, and enveloping everything equally. Then light clears the darkness and brings warmth. The flame of a candle instantly dispels the darkness of anxiety and soothes them. In ancient times, kerosene oil was very precious, so they started to offer the precious lamps as an expression of reverence. Thus, through these customs, we can be reminded that the Buddha's compassion is always uh, delivered to us. An incense burner for offering of incense is also here and everyone is welcome to offer incense. Perhaps you have done so at the funeral services or other occasions. Then I am sometimes asked if people of other religions can offer incense. At that time, I always answer that uh, this is to show respect and not a sign of conversion, so uh, please do so uh, unless you feel uncomfortable. The manner of offering of incense varies from sect to sect, but I will show you how we do it. Uh, now I will show how uh, we do offering of incense. Earlier, I mentioned that our order represents Amida Buddha's pure land, the world of Buddha's enlightenment. And now, among the order ornaments, I would like to focus on the candles more. As I mentioned earlier, the lights clear the darkness and bring warmth. So, uh, it is said that candle lights represent Buddha's light of wisdom. Then when I think about the meaning of this candle, I always remember some story. Actually, it is in this book, The Teaching of Buddha, published by the BDK, which is hosting today's event, and following the story is in it. So let us imagine a desert country lying in absolute darkness with many living things swarming blindly about in it. Naturally, they will be frightened and as they run about without recognizing one another during the night, there will be frequent squirming and loneliness. This is indeed a pitiful sight. Then let us imagine that suddenly a superior man with a torch appears and everything around becomes bright and clear. The living beings in the dark solitude suddenly find a great relief and they look about to recognize one another and happily share their companionship. By a desert country is meant a world of human life when it lies in the darkness of ignorance. And those who have no light of wisdom in their minds wander about in loneliness and fear. They were born alone 
and die alone. They do not know how to associate with their fellow in peaceful harmony, and they are naturally despondent and fearful. So, by a superior man with torch is meant Buddha assuming a human form, and by his wisdom and compassion, he illuminates the world. In this light, people find themselves as well as others and are glad to establish human fellowship and harmonious relations. Thousands of people may live in a community, but it is not one of real fellowship until they know each other and have sympathy for one another. A true community has faith and wisdom that illuminate it. It is a place where the people know and trust one another and where there is social harmony. In fact, harmony is the life and real meaning of a true community or an organization. So this is the story uh, from you know, this book and I always remember this story when I think about the significance of candle light. Today, in this world, there are many different ideas, cultures, countries, races, religions, and so on. Sadly, some of them conflict, probably because of differences or lack of understanding or communication. Even among some small groups, families, or communities, it would happen for the same reasons. However, we can always try to understand others. We can remember that it's essential to build good relationship of mutual trust, understanding, respect, and help, uh, regardless of differences in ideas, culture, philosophy, religion, and so on. The candle lights or the Buddha's light of wisdom will always remind us of it. Today, I received a precious opportunity to introduce Honpa Honganji Hirobetsin to all of you. And it is truly significant that I was able to do that at this interface event. I hope I could show you the exterior and interior of the temple, especially the altar, contain a variety of history and Buddhist teachings and guidance for those of us living in today's world. Please visit us if you are ever in Hiro. Also, if you find a Honganji temple or another Buddhist temple nearby, please visit. So I look forward to meeting you in person next time. So thank you very much for listening. So I want to end my talk by reciting uh, Buddha's sacred name. Namo Thank you, Reverend Kazunori. Sorry. Thank you, Reverend Kazunori, for showing us your place of worship. It is absolutely beautiful. But I would also like to thank all of our presenters, and I would love to open it up for questions. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Um, I would like to open the floor up for questions. The first question I see in the chat are: Are the saints of the Coptic Church the same? Oh my. Okay, hold on. Um, are the saints of the Coptic Church the same as the saints at the Eastern Orthodox or the Roman Catholic churches? And I believe this is a question for our first presenter. Yes, a uh, very good question. So we, in the Coptic Church, we have saints and we also have what is called a Holy Synod. And that's made up of, uh, it's going to answer the other question that I saw in the chat, of our Pope, Pope Tuedros. That's his name in Coptic, or Pope Theodore II. He is um, the Pope and Patriarch of Alexandria. So he's a bishop, but since he's 
um, of the, upon the seat of Alexandria, then he carries that title. He's the first among equals. That's what we call him. So the bishops make up the synod of the Coptic Orthodox Church, and they together are the ones who canonize a saint into the Coptic Orthodox Church. But that does not mean that we do not recognize the Eastern Orthodox or the Roman Catholic Churches. So we do have our Coptic Orthodox saints, but we do also have other saints from the other Orthodox Churches, and we do recognize the Roman um, Catholic saints as well. Very nice. Thank you for sharing. Um, I did notice that there's a few questions in the chat as well. Feel free to speak up and unmute yourselves to ask any of the presenters questions. If you have comments as well, you can share those. I would like to um, hear from actually the presenters first, if they have any um, things that they've noticed of each other and that they would like to ask of each other. So before we take um, questions from the um, participants, let's um, hear from our presenters. If you have anything that, you know, you found a commonality or something new or um, something that you'd like to share. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Malia. I have a question for uh, Reverend Takahashi. I noticed you were wearing the, you were holding beads. I wonder yes. what they signify for, because we do also have um, that uh, tradition of, of, of beads, and it has like 100 beads uh, in, in the lay, but I wonder what, what is representation in your ah. um, culture. Okay, and thank you very much for your question. Uh, this is, uh, this can be said, Buddhist beads in English, in Japanese it's called Nenju, and this is uh, used to uh, respect to show respect to the Buddha, and we use uh, this bees in uh, this way. And uh, actually, the significance of this uh, item is different depending on uh, the denominations of Buddhism. There are many different you know, traditions. Uh, in some, uh, then uh, the meaning can be also different in different, uh, in different schools. Sometimes they use uh, this nenju to count uh, the reciting the name, the reciting the Buddha's names. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in our traditions, you know, uh, we just uh, use this to show our respect uh, mm -hmm. to the Buddha. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just for your information. So we have that too. Yes. Uh, in the Muslim world, you may see Muslims holding the beads. So there are 100 beads and 100. They, uh, they count various Arabic phrases uh, oh. at each, at each. So it's just, it's used for accounting purposes. Oh. So I think that's very similar. Similar. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Thank very you. nice. I want to add that in the Coptic church, we also have a prayer rope. Um, mm. It's similar to the Catholic uh, rosary, actually, and it has small beads, and then it's usually, uh, it can vary in number, it can be as many as 50, it can be as little as 10, and we usually say for each be Lord have mercy, or Yara Burhan in Arabic, or uh, mm. for those in Arabic, and then um, after 10 or a certain number, then we pray the Lord's Prayer of our Father. So it's very nice, actually. It's a very good question. Thank you. All, all three share this. Thank you. Thank you, Father Paul. Okay. Would anybody else like to ask a question to the presenters or share a comment of something that they noticed or found interesting? I've noticed a question, which I believe is referred to me uh, earlier in the chat. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to uh, read it and then maybe try to? Oh, sure. The answer isn't it's long. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I think the question was that they've noticed. Um, they've uh, here. I'll just read it here. I saw pictures of socially distanced Hajj online. I assume it's a similar um, during wedding and ceremony and other similar events. So uh, because of the COVID, um, you know, obviously social distancing was done in the mosque as well. We would stand about six feet apart with masks on. 
uh, weddings. Uh, I one of my family uh, had a wedding in Toronto, Canada, and they just had a drive-through wedding. So basically, they, uh, every family would come, take a picture, and would have a a bantos or, or a, a to-go box with them, and they would just eat in the in the car. So there was a tradition in there as well. So we would try to adapt and you know compromise with, with the condition, but thankfully it's over now. Things are back to normal. So thank you. I also have a question. Uh, did you answer already the question about Kanun? Kanun? Do you mind repeating that one more time? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so I, my daughter is interested in, in various religions and she had a book. She has a book of Kanun. Kanun. And so it is like medieval, right? Um, you know, she reads it and there are a lot of interesting, not only administrative, but everyday even rules for families. And uh, so uh, how important is Kanun is today? Or it is only interesting like historically? If it's for me, uh, the word kanun, um, for me, it's uh, in Arabic, it means Allah. And um, I'm not sure which uh, book exactly that uh, you're referring to that your daughter is reading. But I think um, it was like the end of medi uh, medieval century. Right. Uh, I uh, believe it. Ottoman Empire, but there are also probably rules, administrative rules there. Uh, right it appeared there but then there are a lot of uh, laws uh, referring to family rules like position what women should do what men should do so she reads actually various from various traditions just out of curiosity yeah and thanks I, I, is it, how is today is it read actually it's supposed to be read by everyone every it says at the beginning but maybe nobody but who reads it today yeah, so there, there have been uh, various books written by different like Muslim scholars, saints, philosophers, uh, and physicians. Uh, and this, I believe, is one of them. I'll try to, while I think you're having the other questions, I'll try to dig into it and see if I can get you some more information about it. Thanks so, for uh, yes, okay, thank you very much. I also have a short question. Uh, I noticed them in um, Mecca around mm. They are not wearing white robe, though historically it's supposed to be the robe of Abraham. So everybody's supposed to be in white, but today not everybody's in white, right? So um, uh, about Hajj, basically it predates Islam. Hajj was a ritual that was done uh, even before the existence of Islam. And uh, traditionally they would do Hajj naked. Um, but, you know, when the advent of Islam, Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, he legislated that uh, a white uh, sheet, there should be two sheets, one um, for lower part of the body and the second for the upper part of the body. So for um, all uh, pilgrims uh, or anyone who's visiting the Hajj in Mecca, they are covered in these two white sheets, plain sheets of signifying, uh, you know, simplicity and, and, and um, a new birth, spiritually speaking. Um, so that's, uh, it is, I, I'm not sure which picture you saw, but I'm pretty sure anyone who's going there for a smaller pilgrimage, which is Umrah or for Hajj, they uh, are supposed to wear that. And there are certain points at, of entry where they're supposed to be wearing that dress um, before entering the Mecca. Thanks for asking that question. It was a very intelligent one. Yeah. Um, because I dream one day to go to Egypt, I have a question. Um, about Coptic Church, are there any particular sacred like places to visit today that are particular sacred for Coptic Church? And maybe there are um, some of uh, the most ancient maybe icons there uh, from Orthodox, uh, like ordinary Orthodox Church. I saw one day on Samos, uh, second century icon on the stone. It's on the top of the mountain, but maybe uh, there are today some places where people try to visit in Egypt, particularly. Yes, no, that's a very good question again. Um, so in, in Egypt, I'll speak for Egypt first, um, we have where the Holy Family stayed when they were fleeing from Egypt. They went to Egypt 
And we call that place um, Masr al-Adima, or we call it Old Egypt. And it's, it's near uh, Cairo, and it's where a lot of churches are. There's seven churches there, and they actually preserved an underground area under the churches and it's open to the public to go under and you can see where Christ and where the Holy Family stayed. They still have um, rocks, uh, pieces of rock from that time uh, and they've preserved it. So that's open to the public and also about icons. Another good point is they have um, frescoes or they have really old iconography that's on the stone wall um, so usually they would write an icon on uh, a piece of wood but these were done right on the monastery uh, walls itself and they ha still have it preserved and they are in the ancient monasteries in Egypt so you have the Red Sea, uh, St. Uh, Antony's Monastery in the Red Sea, St. Paul's Monastery in the Red Sea, and you have the monasteries in Wadi al Natrun in Egypt, uh, near Cairo, um, St. Beshoi's Monastery, and the uh, Syrian Monastery as well, uh, and St. Mary's Monastery, and St. Macarius. Those four monasteries, they are the most ancient. And then you also have two other areas. You have uh, in uh, Sinai, and then you have in Jerusalem, of course, um, a lot of Christians go to the, the tomb of Christ, and uh, they see the, the, the resurrection church, and also the nativity where Christ was born. So between those three, those are the most important uh, areas or places um, where a lot of Coptic and Christians would go. Very nice. Thank you for sharing. Um, I believe that we have one more question. Yeah, I have a question. As leaders of your specific church, what has been the most impactful memory or experience that you've had that helped either your growth or just helped you like through a hard time? Because I'm sure you guys have hard days too, your leadership roles. Um, let's have one presenter answer um, in order. So let's have Father Isaac first, and then we can go down the line. Yeah. Uh, very good question. Again, um, I would, okay, I'll share with you two things, uh, two memories that were impactful for me. Um, one is journeying with a person during their catechism. So a person might have come um, older uh, in their life and they're looking for a religion, for their faith, and they come and they see the church, they want to sit, they want to learn. And it's different for each person. Some people it takes six months, uh, some people it takes a year, two years, three years. It's different for each person, but it's amazing when they are baptized and they tell you themselves how they feel, what is different. They partake of the Eucharist and they're a member of the church. Another impactful memory I will share with you is um, there was a person who converted to Coptic Christianity and they wanted to confess. And it was their first time they converted um, in their forties and they began to confess and they just started weeping and that in and of itself were tears of repentance and that was very impactful for me and I believe that that person coming to confess was God teaching myself uh, a lesson in humility and those two were in impactful memories that I will truly never forget so very good question and I'm very happy to share those with Okay, can we have um, Imam Matjula? Sure, thank you, Emma. Uh, before I, I uh, answer that, I'd just like to mention the earlier question about the kanun. 
So um, I just found out that it was written by an individual called, he was a physician philosopher, Avicenna. In Arabic, we call it Avicenna. He was a great physician of the 11th century. And uh, he wrote this book. The full name is al kanun tib or the, the Law of Medicine or the Canon of Medicine. That's roughly how it's translated. Thank you. Um, so about this, I think a strong experience in terms of hardship. I do have a personal story, which I'll try to uh, sum it up. I we, uh, we had, um, you know, like it just shows how powerful prayer is. We're all believers, right? And uh, a, you, however way, I think God loves us all equally and he listens to our prayer equally. But my experience was that we did not have any child after our marriage for six years we've tried uh, different uh, you know fertility treatments and whatnot and uh, uh, after six years we decided to fly to london that's where our spiritual head lives his holiness the caliph of islam and uh, we my wife started you know became emotional because this experience had had a long a huge toll on us uh, financially um you know emotionally as well so um, his holiness uh, said to us that you should come next year and bring your child with you. So that just his, him saying that was just remarkable. And at that moment, we knew that we'll be blessed. And uh, the next month, you know, we had my wife tested positive and we flew back after exactly after one year with the child and show, you know, it was a daughter that was born. So this is just an experience. How we, the, I think experiences like these strengthen our faith uh, in God, right? It doesn't matter which uh, faith we belong to. So thank you. What a beautiful story. Wow. Um, Kazunori, would you like to? Would you yes, like to yeah. share? yes. Yeah, thank you for the question. Actually, I cannot select, you know, one, you know, <laughs> a special memory, but uh, as a, a Buddhist minister, uh, the great memories are always that, you know, I can share the Buddha's teachings, you know, with others. You know, I have had many opportunities to talk or have conversation with many people through like a study class or my, uh, after the uh, religious services, uh, including, you know, this kind of event. And uh, some people uh, really uh, seek uh, and the religions and some people, you know, just you know, want to know uh, what the Buddhism is. Then I have had many opportunities to share Buddha's teachings with them. Then the, sometimes some people said, oh, thank you very much. Now uh, I understand the Buddha's teachings. Or, or thank you very much. I had a really nice time to uh, talk with you about the Buddha's teachings. When I heard uh, this kind of comments, I'm always, you know, so happy, and uh, I uh, remember I have many uh, great memories of uh, having conversation about Buddha's teachings. And also, you know, through the conversation and uh, while talking about the Buddha's teachings, I can also learn, you know, from uh, them. So I think that's a, a really special experience for me. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, for sharing. I have a question that I would like to ask. Um, in I'm 21 right now, and it's not the social norm for anyone that I know of to become a religious leader. So how did you guys come to the realization that this was a life path for you guys? We can go down the line again, <laughs> starting with Father Paul. Uh, a very good question. Um, in Arabic, there's a phrase, I'll try to find a rough translation in English, um, where it says, you don't seek it, but at the same time, you don't reject it for the priesthood. So it's almost, it, it is a calling, and it has to do with um, a lot of prayer. So um, myself i have a, a father that i go to for spiritual guidance and confession and when it came up that my name was suggested as a candidate um, i immediately went to him i told him of course i am i'm not worthy of of any of this and he said you know what just pray leave it alone and if it's truly what um 
God has will for you, then it will come on its own. There's no reason um, to have it, you know, uh, overbearing or to make it more than it is. If it's from God, then it will happen. So I feel as though, of course, with a lot of prayer, with a lot of spiritual guidance, then um, God will show you the way. And of course, we all need God's love and God's support um, in our lives. And it doesn't matter if we're a religious leader or, or anything, because again, we're here uh, to show God's love to everyone. Thank you, Father Paul. Um, I guess it's my turn, Emma. Okay. Um, so uh, my story is in grade eight. My my brother would uh, make sure that I read at least a portion of the Holy Quran. Um, so I would he would just call me and then I'll just read it to him over the phone. And one uh, verse which just it just clicked, and uh, that verse goes: "Wa man aslama wajhahu lillahi wa huwa muhsinun." The one who submits to God and does good work will not have to worry about his future anxieties or his past mistakes or sins. So I thought of, uh, of a life where I would want to be free of any worry, uh, contentment, just peace of mind. And uh, this verse promised me that. So, um, you know, I, it's been about 10, 10 years so far. And I think I made the right, right decision because this is absolutely what I was promised for and I am living that dream. Yeah, thank you. Excuse me, Emma. You, yes, could you, of course. Yeah, sorry, could you tell me your question again? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I just said that um, at my age, I personally do not know anyone that is taking the religious path to become a priest or to become a faith leader. And I wanted to know, how did you guys end up at that career path? I'm not quite sure career is the right way, but right word, but that path, that life path. Okay. Can I share my personal story with you? Of course, please. Yeah, so as I was introduced at the beginning of my presentation, I was born in the temple family. But therefore, my parents, my father, my grandfather was also a Buddhist minister. Then I was expected to, you know, take over my home temple. Then, however, you know, when I was a teenager, honestly speaking, somehow, it was hard for me to become interested in religion, Buddhism. Then yeah, yeah, I, I wanted to be you know, school teacher. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but therefore, at that time, I think I do not have a, let's say, the farm, as a, as a foundation of you know, faith, yeah, religious foundation. But, however, you know, I encountered the how say chance to learn Buddha's teachings by chance no later yeah. uh, when I attended the uh, university then uh, after uh, I started learning it I thought oh it's very interesting why I didn't notice it yeah so maybe so if I can if there's something I can share with you uh, maybe I think on one hand, it's good to seek, continue seeking. But if you are interested in something, I think you can try to get more information. But even if it's you know, hard to find you know, something, I think you don't need to rush. And maybe you can talk with many different people. Then the one day, maybe you encounter something. And uh, this is uh, based on my experience thank you very nice thank you all for sharing um i'm gonna open the grounds up again for a few more questions i have another question but i'll save it in case anybody else has questions to ask uh, there's a question on IG. Yeah. There's one question. okay um okay this is from clyde what may we do as separate faiths to bring all people of Hawaii together in unity. Um, anyone can take this as they feel fit. 
Uh, I can give a short answer and if any other presenters want to add or chime in, they can. Please feel free. I believe um, Father Anastasi, who was the, the monk priest here before I got here, I believe he had an event in either 2016 or 2018, I can't recall. It was a uh, Praise the Lord event or Praise the Lord event. And he invited uh, many different faiths. And it was almost like an event like this, interfaith. And everyone came and just had maybe 10, 15 minutes and they chanted um, a hymn or they shared uh, something small about their faith. And I think that's how we get people from se separate faiths to have um, unity, especially here in Hawaii, because it is diverse. And at the same time, it's not a very large population. So I feel like we are the perfect uh, place and the perfect model to really strive to have unity here. So I believe just events like those could help. But I'm sure the other presenters have good ideas as well. Yes, I, I would second that, absolutely. Clyde, I think we're doing exactly what needs to be done, interfaith dialogues. And uh, also in the Holy Quran, God says that, um, say to the people of the book, people of the book is a term which is used for the Christians and the Jews. Uh, so God says, say to the people of the book that uh, we worship the same God that you worship. So let us come together and uh, celebrate that. So, um, so I think that's something that also can be highlighted that, you know, the similarities that we have um, that we can celebrate and discuss those uh, like we're doing right now. Okay. Uh, I also agree with the Paul, uh, the Father Paul and the Imam uh, Matthew Dla. Uh, I think, you know, having this kind of, you know, event uh, is very, you know, important. And uh, me, the uh, uh, bring uh, to bring all people of Hawaii together in unity, and uh, you know to uh, say, uh, attain to attain uh, this goal. I think it's important to continue having this kind of event, and especially you know knowing uh, others and uh, knowing you know each other. You know, without this kind of event, uh, I, I hardly have my. Uh, chances uh, to uh, talk uh, with others. Then, uh, sorry, I want to share you know, something with you. Uh, this is relating to the teaching of Buddhism. Actually, I wanted to share it during my presentation, but the time was limited, so I didn't include it. Actually, in Buddhism, uh, there is another very important symbol in the altar. Do you know the lotus flower? Lotus flower. Uh, I think that in the today's uh, event uh, prior, uh, I have this. Uh, I think the lotus is here. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. The lotus is a very important flower, and uh, it is said that in the Buddha's war, Pure Land, too, there are so many lotuses. And the lotus, uh, there are many different colors of lotuses, like a uh, red color. Uh, uh, blue color, yellow color, white colors, then the pure land looks so beautiful. But in addition, those flowers you know, shine each other. Yeah. Uh, therefore, uh, in the Buddha's world, uh, Buddha's world are uh, decorated beautifully with such lotus flowers. And uh, in our world too, yeah, like the color of flowers, there are many different colors. Then, uh, through knowing others, I think you know we can shine uh, each other, each other, and uh, create a great you know community. Yeah. So I wanted to uh, share it with you. Thank you for sharing. I definitely enjoyed everyone's sentiments, but especially um, getting together and doing exactly what we're doing today. That seems very important and realizing that we're not all that much different than each other, no matter what religion we choose to aspire to be part of. And then, so my last question is, um, how do you see Buddha, Allah, Jesus as a friend, Lord, teacher, um, still being so far into your faith as a leader versus as just a worshiper? 
we can go down the line. <laughs> we can go down the line again. Um, we let's start with you, Father Bob. Okay. No, very good question. It's a very uh, realistic and um, uh, <clears throat> question that we all face, um, and I believe that you know, for all of us, if our relationship isn't strong. Um, if our faith isn't strong with ourselves, then we hinder ourselves and we also hinder others when we try to help others because we have to be strong in order to help others. And I think it's just like, again, practically speaking, it's as if you have um, a best friend or a father and a father will love you. And sometimes he will um, chasten you, um, but it's all out of love. And that's something that we always have to remember. And the more you talk to your father, the more that you confide in your father, uh, you have to keep that relationship strong and you have to put effort. Because once you do all of those, then the relationship will be strong. You will um, have a good feeling, a good, and then you can further share that with others. So it all starts within yourself. And you have to put effort, and then after that, then you can share with others as well. Thank you for sharing. Um, do we want to um, go down the line? <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, I'm very lucky to be in the middle. So either when a person starts from the first or the last, I will always have something <laughs> to think in the back of my head to, <laughs> for the answer. So, um, yeah. So I think in the Holy Quran, God the Almighty states that wa iza sa'alaka ibadi anni fa inni karib ujibu da'awtada iza da'an that when my servant asks thee about me, God is saying that to Prophet Muhammad, when my servant asks thee about me, tell them that I am near. I listen the call of the supplicant when he prays to me. So this is his promise. This is uh, that uh, God has given us that he would always reply. So that is something that I find uh, inspiration in as a Muslim, that uh, as a Muslim, we do not have, have to go through any agency. Even for a Muslim, he does not have to go or she does not have to go to God through me. He, they have this personal relationship. So that personal concept of personal God uh, is there, and that's what we find inspiration in. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, you know, Emma, could you tell me the question again? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it was, how do you see Buddha Allah or Jesus as a friend, Lord, teacher, even still as being a religious leader versus being a worshiper? Like, I assume the rest of us are in this uh, in this Zoom. Okay, so uh, you don't know how do I see Buddha as a religious leader and as a one of the followers? Yeah, of course. I said a uh, friend, Lord, teacher. Um, mm. How do you how do you see that relationship um, as uh, a religious leader? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this may be relating to our uh, Buddhist teaching. Uh, actually, now uh, I'm uh, serving uh, this temple as a religious leader, yeah? uh, as a Buddhist minister. But uh, if I go to the Buddhist teachings, I'm one of the uh, how to say, human beings, but typical you know, human beings. Yeah. So uh, then as a Buddhist minister, I share the Buddha's words, Buddha Dharma with others. But uh, at the same time, I feel that I'm walking the path of life uh, listening to the Buddha's teachings you know, with others. So uh, I, I always feel that you know, uh, I should not forget you know, that attitude. But even you know, uh, when I serve, uh, temple as a religious data. Okay. Thank you. For I, I, I yes. hope I could answer your question. No, that was a good answer. Thank yes. you for yeah. sharing. Um, I'm going to open the floor up again just for any last questions before we kind of do some closing remarks. All right. No more. Um, okay. 
I would like to thank everyone for attending this meeting, especially Father Paul, Imam Matula, and Reverend Kazunori. Um, I would like to introduce Ka'ali'i Aloha Swart. She's a bi biology major and she will be graduating in 2023 for closing benediction. Um, hi everyone. Um, we'll be closing with a recording of an Oli or a Hawaiian chant called Oli Mahalo. Um, it is a chant for thanks and closing and there will be lyrics. So I invite you all to chant along if you would like to. Mahalo. Uh, thank you very much, Ke'ili, for the closing. Um, our gratitude, our thanks, and especially um, for all of our um, guests that have shared with us from the richness of your traditions and that have just been uh, enhancing the lives of all of us here in Hawaii. I'd like to also a special mahalo to our graduates, Emma, Brittany, and Izzy, um, Kathleen, Anella, and who are from my Christians and Buddhist in Dialogue class. So thank you very much for um, participating and for helping us out uh, with today's event. And um, once again, if anyone wants to you know, visit any of these um, sacred places, then um, you're welcome to, Father Paul, maybe you can add that in the chat, um, your addresses to your places or contacts so that uh, people can have that, or you can reach out to me at mwangtu at shamana.edu. But uh, I'd like to say thank you again for joining us. And all that's all.